everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here again with Joseph Alexander. Hi Joseph. Hey, how you doing? You okay? I'm good. Great to have you back on the show. Just a little introduction. Joseph is a musician and the author of over 40 books on playing the guitar. His latest book, which is more for authors and why he's back on the show, is Self-Published Millionaire, which is a pretty exciting title, which is an insight into his own publishing process and tips along the way, which is super exciting. So just to get started, for those people who might not have heard you from episode so 342, which was last year. Just give us a bit of an overview of your own writing and publishing journey. Um, yeah, everything really came out of me uh, struggling at music college and trying to find my own own, own path through learning music. Um, finished college and I was teaching loads of private students and I was writing down what I was I was teaching them and um, I was ending up with these big piles of, of paper and, and resources that I was giving to them and somebody kind of just mentioned to me that I should kind of put them into a book so I did and um, you know my first book was about trying to sort of find a easy route through learning jazz and um, I sent it off along with three DVDs of audio examples to a to like a London sort of music based publishing company and they was like oh we really like the book that's great but that's absolutely commercially in, unviable for us um, there's no way we can do three DVDs you know it's hard enough to sell guitar books at the moment anyway you know no one's buying these things so mm. I thought oh, okay no worries didn't think about it anymore until somebody told me about um well, it's create space and uh, K kdp um so i sort of didn't really think anything of it threw it up on amazon with a terrible cover and, and no real editing and things like that and this was about six years ago now so um i was lucky and and you know, people found it and a few things it started to sell. And, um, you know, I was a self-employed guitar teacher. So I thought, oh, that's nice. You know, there's a little bit of money coming in, ticking over in the background. And um, that'd be a nice pension. So I thought, oh, well, I've, I've got loads more stuff. So I wrote another one and, and that really sort of kicked off. <laughs> and so I ended up writing about 14 books in that sort of first year or just, just using the things that I had around and um accidentally sort of developed this brand fundamental changes and yeah here we are it's sort of six years later it's turned into a publishing company and sort of it's just grown quite organically as i ran out of stuff to write about um i i reached out to sort of friends and musicians that i knew and they they sort of saw that i had a brand that seemed viable and we started off with a 50 50 deal so they wrote the books i edited them we put i put them on amazon we split everything and it's grown i think we've got about 120 books now so and i think this year we've we've just published our 30th book this year so it's just grown way beyond sort of what I ever could have conceived of quite sort of you know certainly the first year or so was by accident before I realized there was something quite viable there. Mm, wow I love this story because it really shows like you taking something that you were doing in real life and then kind of turning it into a book and a, a product yeah. that people could then use themselves and yeah I, th I find it hilarious that they this publisher told you that it was hard enough to sell music books yeah <laughs> and now it you're was... like just going for it do you think that like you said that of the time difference it has digital downloads of audio also helped you because you don't do cds with your books right you have well no downloads. And, you know yeah no and if you know i'm sure most people listening have had some experience with you know kdp and yeah there's absolutely no facility to include a, a cd with your book you print it and that's what they do and they do it really well so, you know, going back then, my, my kind of thought was, well, I, I really want to include audio. You know, if you buy a guitar book or a music book these days, or, you know, at that time, everything came with a CD or a DVD. I was like, well, I want to include that. It's the 21st century. So I just started up a really simple, like, WordPress site and provided all the downloads for free. Mm. And... It's only about a year and a half, I think, to realise, hang on a sec, why don't I just ask for everybody's email address before they, they download it? And, um, you know, by doing that, we've, we've our mailing list is about to hit 60,000 people, I think, and they're all pretty much people who have brought, uh, bought books from us before. Mm. So, 
um, that becomes like a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, now as, as the, the mailing list grows, we can launch new books to more people. You know, they get, you know, highly rated on Amazon and, and then they download the audio and, and the word sort of spreads. So, mm. um, yeah, yeah. and then I think yeah. the, the mailing list, we did quite a deep dive into your mailing list in yeah. um, episode 342. I'm mentioning it again <laughs> because it's incredibly valuable to learn about um, how Joseph has done this mailing list thing. And it's it's brilliant. It's absolute genius. But people can go back and listen to another show about that. But I did want to just revisit on print products because, again, mm. we hear so much about um, indie authors making money with ebooks. Um I mean, I guess it's logical in some form that a music book would be print. But what what are some of the tips for gaining traction with a print product? Have you done specific marketing around print, or um, you know, what what are some tips on print specifically? I would love to give you some really awesome insight here. I think you know the real answer is is because it's nonfiction and because it's a manual maybe even more so because it's music because people want to have something physical on their guitar mm. stand you know the music stand if you if you think about the limitations of a kindle and they are great you know i, I read all all the time on my kindle but if you want to if you've got notation it's going to be that big if you double tap it yeah you can fill the screen but you know you can do that really one line at a time mm. so there is almost like a natural disadvantage to to the kindle for what we do and a, and a huge advantage for um you know a, a paperback i mean we we sort of print what's that you know eight and a half by 11 you know it's a big book and you can see the music really clearly on that i think yeah unfortunately in terms of marketing a lot of it does just come down to the niche that that we have unfortunately um or fortunately but, i think that is a tip you have dominated i mean do you see do you just dominate guitar books now um, there's more competition than there used to be, certainly. And we've noticed recently that like AMS is is probably getting a bit more expensive and there's more people out there doing it. Mm. Um, but because of the amount that, that we sell um, and the amount of authors that we're, we're attracting, you know, like the book I just held up was a book by Jens Larson and we, we reached out to him because, you know, he's got 100-odd thousand. He's a great guitarist, first and foremost, it should be said. Like, he's great, but he's because he's great, he's got a huge sort of social media reach. So we're like, well, do you want us to work with you and, and put this book together? So we we can continually bring in, like, new writers, which, you know, it's more of a publishing thing that – that maybe we'll we'll get on to later, mm. but due to the amount of books that we have, we we don't feel the the, the competition is particularly an issue at the moment. But there is sort of a general trend of more people doing it, which which is fine. You know, the mm. the more kind of the more people who are independently publishing well, I think for the industry as a whole, that's good. Yeah, I totally uh, agree. And um, just on the manual thing, I do is. think that other niches can learn from it because, like you said, these mm. bigger books, um, for example, I've got workbooks. So nonfiction mm. writers can do yeah. bigger workbooks that people want to buy as print products because then they can write in them, Yeah, for example. And I, I remember I was listening to one of your interviews a few weeks ago and uh, you were talking uh, about the large print stuff as well. Mm. I mean, that's a perfect example of being able to push people in the direction of print because, you know, the profit margins do seems to be higher on print for us um than they are on on kindle and you know saying that i, sh I should say right from the off we we kindle to paperback actually which you know i know talking to other self-published authors that's very very high you know mm. what i mean like really really high but um you know, we sell a lot of ebooks too, and you know all the all the standard stuff that we we talk about a lot in terms of AMS and building a list, and you know getting your lead magnets and all this kind of thing. That stuff's still important, but mm. I I don't know if there's something specific other than kind of the non-fiction manual type thing that is really going to push people towards paperback rather mm. than. Than, than print because just, that's just um, the world we live in so you just cut off on the percentage i think you said the percentage that was print yeah with we're, we're about 50 50 mm. yeah it's about 55 45 in favor of um kindle but yeah we still sell a lot of of paperbacks um mm. compared to, to a lot of self-published authors so 
Well, I think yeah. the, the tip is if you write nonfiction, get a print book because oh, it, yeah. I still am just gobsmacked when people don't do a print version, especially print on demand. You don't have to do. Um, I mean, I find it crazy that we've been talking about this in, in the, at this point in history. But um, let's move on to um, scaling because we're really talking about scaling a publishing business. Mm. And I know some people listening, like me particularly, uh, I'm an example. I do not want to work with other authors. I've yes. done some co-writing. Co-writing to me is different to you kind of like you're saying you reached out with a strategic partnership and mm. you know working with authors and publishing so first of all let's talk about the kind of the mindset what is the difference between just being the author and then being a publisher producer you know that kind of uh, partnership like how did you shift your thinking there it, it was yeah it, it's difficult and it's still difficult the mindset for me because I love the writing side of it and because it, it grew out of a partnership thing, really, where I was I was saying to really friends who, who could play guitar better than me and I was saying, well, you write down what's in your head and we will make that into the book for you and we'll, we'll go 50-50. But uh, I wasn't a writer when I started and I in no way expect a, a musician to come in and, and be a writer. So... It's great when they are, and we've had some books come in that have been fantastic. You know, we've barely needed to touch them in terms of editing. They've been brilliant. But mm. there's, you know, there's books that have come in where people's first language isn't, say, English. And, and we've actually had to get really deep into the editing, you know, right from a developmental stage. So while the first sort of books I, I published, The Three Fundamental Changes, I, it was kind of just a case of like, I'm going to roll my sleeves up and rewrite this. And, and not really from like an ego point of view, like it has to be done my way. But what I found is that things at work, and there are certain things that you can you can explain a musical point quite clearly and, and it's sort of the nut, nuts and bolts of tuition. Mm. So that, that, was, that was sort of the early stages. And now what, my company does is I work with people really from an early stage and it's so of course we get we get manuscripts submitted and sometimes they're great and, and we can just run with them but when we're reaching out to another author the, that mental shift is really right how am I going to work with them to get the most out of them get the best book for them that's going to a reflect what they do b be a great book and, and see some b something that we can market so it comes down to almost coaching them so the first thing is okay wait let's get on the phone let's get on skype let's talk this through what's going to be your book um plan you know once we've talked about what kind of titles or what they're going to be doing so it would be making sure they've got a really solid plan that's been broken down into each you know maybe 10 rough chapter titles with three or four key points in them then at that point, we'll give them all our house templates, our house style stuff, and, you know, need, like all the music files and things that they, they can use. And they'll check in after three pages, and we'll do an edit on that. Mm. We'll send it back to them, we'll talk them through the edit, and then they'll go away and maybe write 10 pages, and then, you know, get up to the first chapter. And by actually having more touch points with them, it means that by the time they've done that, their first one or two chapters, they're really in the mindset. Because what's re we've had this happen once or twice, and it was my bad for not, you know, catching it, was I've spoken to people, and they've just disappeared. I thought, oh, I'm not going to see them again. And they come back six months later with, with a manuscript, and it's just not publishable and it's much more work to do that so i guess that the mindset thing is well we're yeah we're going to have to work with authors to bring them the most out of them and allocate sort of allocate our resources in terms of editing and time and covers and and, and marketing and things like mm. usefully because we're you know we're working with probably 10 writers at, at a time you know so it's quite busy yeah I could busy well it's really interesting to hear you talk about it because obviously I mean I say obviously but I get a lot of people who ask me about publishing them and I'm like no I don't you don't run a publishing company and I think there is a very different thing I wonder whether you're 
ability to do this actually comes out of your teaching and your coaching kind of lovely patience. You seem to have a lovely patience that I just can't imagine. I don't think my girlfriend would say that. <laughs> well, but, you, um... you sound like you have a lovely patience. But I was, yeah, I was just thinking after. here, you know, my, my issue with this um, a delegate, that almost for most authors listening, the problem is not running a publishing company the problem is delegating anything it's Mm -hmm. the mark of a successful indie author seems to be a little bit of control freakery around things so I wonder how how are you able to kind of relax that control freakery side of you and that kind of moves into this hiring other people uh, because in the book you talk about hiring virtual assistants and an assistant say in the Philippines which a lot of authors need to take that first step of hiring a, an assistant in some form so can you talk about that kind of letting go and how to find people to work with yeah it's quite hard that sort of perfectionist thing is I think endemic in in all writers, you know what I mean? It's just like this is this book is part of me, you know, even a non-fiction guitar book. It's like, well, you know, this is my thoughts on music, this is how I play, this is a really personal thing. So any any side of that. But I mean there's sort of um there's different levels of it, really. You know, there's everything from, you know what, I need someone to just answer all the technical emails i get every day you know if i had to answer every i can't download my audio kind of email i'd never get so and there was you know there was like years where i did and i would come in in the morning and have like five emails or whatever and after you know it'd be like i can't get my audio i'm like right you know what i mean so um and that that would lead to a chain of 10 emails but i can show somebody how to do that it's quite a simple process when you know how so at the sort of most easy stuff to give away like technical support um you know um running a mailing list or anything that's sort of not directly writing based That's the kind of stuff that I think people should be trying to give away. If there's a budget there, of course, you know, and and that's that's definitely a concern because it's all very well to say, you know, I'll just pay someone to do it. But actually, you know, that's not not realistic for the vast majority of people. And it was only after I've been doing this for a few years where it's actually, you know what, where is my time best spent? So if you do have a budget for it, any kind of jobs that are repetitive, samey and and um distract you from writing or marketing your book um i think should should go um but talking about finding people you know that is going to be the public face of your of you or your business that that's more difficult we used upwork um as much as possible um because we found that their form that their kind of platform is really reliable what we'll do is we'll probably work with somebody for you know a month or so and if, if it's going really well we'll try and pull them away from upwork and we'll use like transfer wise or paypal to just pay them directly because mm-hmm. that works quite an expensive platform um in terms of hiring people it if you put a job up for you know virtual assistant you'll get you can potentially get thousands of replies for it which is quite daunting so what we do is we hide little questions in that like a bit sneaky you know like it'll be blah 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 looking for a va you need to do this need to do this what's your favorite color la 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 la. and we and they could be the best person in the world but if they've missed that question it's just joke you're gone because unfortunately you you want somebody who's got that that, that bit of attention to detail another thing that we'd be we i was living in thailand when i first started doing it it'd be like okay so i need you to what's gonna what's the cheapest flight from phuket to manchester on the 17th of november or whatever and so just little things in there um the, the final line would always be um you know spent send your re- reply to this job posting with the words i am a human because there's a load of like bots on there as well so all these little things are going to help whittle it down mm. working up now i tried working with a few editors on upwork for my stuff and because again my stuff's fairly niche and editors are quite expensive you know that that for me was more problematic um, to to do that, so gen, genuinely, I kept most. I did most of the editing myself on, on other people's work. However, um, 
we've just started well you know been doing it about 10 months we've been working with a uh, a publishing services company in the uk who i i just met a guy at a guitar retreat and he happened to be um a, a writer an editor he had you know great resources when it came to doing covers and i was just like well we'll just pay you a retainer and now it's just like the book comes in i'll read it i'll probably do a basic edit on it and that goes off to uh, to his company now and then that will come back so mm. that's one of the reasons we've been able to sort of crank up the amount of books that we're putting out but yeah i mean they're sort of a very professional company and it, it depends where you are as well of course you know i think you know we, we talk about this quite a lot and i know you talk about it too is that you you need to have an editor if you need to have um a front cover designer if you can't you know if you can't do it yourself mm. i think i'm not don't want to put words into your mouth there, oh no but. i absolutely but and i think this is the <clears throat> almost the issue i mean i i've always had an, a problem with self-publishing <laughs> and right. you know I, I mean evidently you're not self-publishing either i mean you might have at the very very beginning but in terms of using mm -hmm. professional designers professional mm -hmm. um covers professional editing yeah. um mm -hmm. professional formatting uh yeah. i mean i even i love your style guides i i remember a few years back um i was contacted around that uh, dummies series oh and, right yeah yeah and they you know their stuff all has a very specific style guide design guide mm. um and i was just like i just can't work within that type of structure but i can see yeah. why it's so important for the for the brand i think so it's it's just designed to make our lives easier at the other end but there is exactly what you said come to us and they want us to publish their book and we're like, okay, and we just smash them over the head with this like massive like how to write guide, then nothing's ever gonna get done because they're too scared to write anything. So what we do get to do, because we're quite small and, and really chilled out and we're working with musicians and like we don't work with anyone that we don't want to work with because you know, like life's too short, you know what I mean? We want to work with, with people where we're good for them, they're good for us and we want it to be chill. Is that I like, have a read through this style guide if it's not 100% in that, that's fine. Don't worry. Like we're here to edit, like we're a publishing company. We're here to edit and do all this stuff for you. It helps us if you can do that. So please do have a look at it. And there are some super important things in terms of them um, producing images and getting them into the documents in the correct way and all this kind of thing. But aside from that, just write. And that's why we have all these early touch points. It's like, you know, um, a particular bugbear of mine, certainly in nonfiction, it's probably quite a good tip for anyone, is people starting off sentences was with, um, okay, guys, in the next example, what we are going to be looking at is, uh, and it's sort of a whole sentence between, you know, and you don't want to be, there's a balance, sure, but mm. it's kind of like, okay, example 3C shows you how to use this arpeggio over this chord or whatever. And it's mm. like straight to the point and without all this preamble, because if you're explaining something that is quite complicated anyway, you kind of want to get to the point. So I know it's sort of a little random aside, but writing telling people what they want to hear without trying to be sort of too polite and too sort of you know english about mm. it um, i think that's true i mean even my own non-fiction books have a the covers are all have a certain look um mm. oh some of them are behind me <laughs> on the video oh, oh there they are um but, but also the use of subheads as you say i mean i would have used a subhead there you know mm. you don't have to go okay here's what we're going to look at you just need a the, what you're yeah. going to look at you know like a subhead or something it's clear from but, con context yeah, right exactly. Exactly. But there, the voice, there is voice in nonfiction as well and a brand. Mm. I like that. So I want to come back to Upwork. Um, yeah, yeah. Because sorry. I'm really interested in your <laughs> translation yeah. project. Because we talked about this last time in that it's much easier for you to do translation because the number of words is actually less yeah. than, yeah, say, yeah. a novel. And also because it's nonfiction, it's easier. But um, can you talk about how you're doing the translation with the books and, and how you're ensuring quality? Yeah, um, essentially, you, the, the short answer to that is we use two translators. And so if they'll, they'll both be working on different books, but then they'll swap work. 
Mm-hmm. So it's kind of almost like that test at school that, okay, everybody should swap with your, with your person that's sitting next to you and, and check it over. So they can, they can flag it up if there is an issue. And like, I don't speak Portuguese and my Spanish is pretty terrible. So I can't, you're right, I can't check that. So really, it is a case of trusting the translators to to do a good job on it, but also by that kind of level of redundancy by having them swap swap books and you know just paying them a little you know for a few extra hours of of going through it. If anything sort of gets flagged up, it's either going to come down to quite often me not being clear in what I originally wrote, um, or or just a mistake. And uh, there's, I can't think of any any point where any of the translators have been particularly precious about their work because it's not you know the the thing that absolutely blows my mind that you know the the um, I can't remember his name, the guy that translates Haruki Murakami, because that's such beautiful, beautiful writing. And it's, you know, it's incredible literature to capture that tone of, of, of his level of sort of esoteric novel. For me, that's just, you know, that's such an art. Whereas, again, like we write nonfiction guides. So it is kind of like, do this, don't do this, which mm. sort of um, hopefully. It is pretty, you know, it's, it's quite straight, straightforward. Um, Did you find and, them on artwork? Yeah, it was kind of a crazy one. Because like I've, I've done things where I've had to audition musicians on Upwork, but I've never had to audition their, like, playing their musical knowledge and their translation skills as well. So, I mean, I travelled a lot and I'm still trying to try and get out of the country as often as I can. And, and through doing that, I'm very fortunate that I've got friends who speak fluent Portuguese, fluent Spanish, fluent German. So when I originally hired the people that we were working with, uh, and again, Upwork, so we probably got about 20 applications for each language. I was like, okay, we, I'm sorry, we do need you to do a test, obviously. If you need a few dollars for, for doing this, that's fine. But I just sort of pulled out a particularly, you know, one of the more intricate pages of, of teaching that we'd got um, in one of the books. I forget which one it was and said, right, can you just translate this? And so we ended up with, you know, 20 different translations. And I, I just gave them to friends and, and, they, and they were just like, this guy, definitely, this lady, definitely and this one. So I don't know how you would you sort of go about that if you if you didn't have sort of trusted people who, who spoke other language but you know to be honest with you there must be editors out there who who speak other languages on mm. our work so you might have to just just kind of tweak that process a little bit until you can find someone that you really trust or you know get 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 a spanish teacher for an hour or whatever yeah, exactly and, it's just a bit it's about it, i think one of the massive things that i hope people are getting from this is they're treating your business like a business and you're paying professionals to do mm. work for you and this is paid work this is mm. so i see so much in the indie author community the sort of how can we do more stuff for free whereas i think the creation of intellectual property assets which is the basis mm. of our business it, yeah. you know you have to respect professionals and you you know you yeah. get you get what you pay for so this is what I'm seeing now when I and I got into translations too early this is always my problem and so and also I did fiction big mistake because of the like you say the difference in fiction and non-fiction so but one of the biggest stumbling blocks I had was the marketing or in another language. So for example, now in English language books, we have Amazon ads, AMS, we have Facebook, we can do emails because we speak English. Mm -hmm. So how are you doing marketing in other languages? Well, it's really, for us, it's it's really simple. We're just running AMS. On, On what, but it's not available everywhere, right? No, but we do sell Spanish books in America. Okay. Now, Unfortunately for okay, so we managed to really badger the Create Space expanded distribution services and kind of um, managed to get them to place our books in Brazil, like paperback. And I knew, I think it was Amazon printing. I'm not quite sure how it was going on, but it was sort of. Um, I probably shouldn't say this, but it was a bit of a, a bit of a chat after the London Book Fair. At sort of, a, I can't really talk about it. But it was like he was like, "There is a way of doing this," and and so we managed to do that. But now Create Space is gone. We've totally lost. Um, we've totally lost Brazil. our mm. Brazil, which is annoying. But there is Spain, you know, and I think there's Portugal as well. But they don't have AMS. They don't have AMS. No, but I think again. 
it, it sort of pains me to say, but I think we're just quite lucky because, you know, if people are searching for guitar, you know, in, in Spain, then like we're going to pop up. It's, it's, mm. we're not doing, we're not doing novels. So again, yeah. I think mm. that, so that keywords, knowledge. basically. Keywords. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. You can do your manual keywords on that. But mm. um, yeah, um, we, we do sell, we've got like our AMS ads for our Spanish books in the U S like they're running at about 1.94% <laughs> cost of sale. They're ridiculous because well, there's, there's so few, so few. Mm. so few people search for it, but when they do and they find it, then, you know, chances are if they like the look of it, they're going to, they're going to buy it. So yeah, I, I, I do feel lucky. That, that I do what I do because our, I mean, saying that it would work for any nonfiction thing, any, any nonfiction genre, but it, it kind of comes back to book titles quite a lot as well. Like our book titles are so sort of SEO friendly, mm-hmm. you know, like to the point of being boring, but findable. And I kind of think, well, what are people searching for when they're looking for this book? And like you, you, you sort of do it as well. Like, I mean, how to write nonfiction? What a brilliant, you know, what a brilliant book title. <laughs> yeah, so boring and yet so correct. <laughs> it's not, yeah, exactly. It's not even boring. It's just you know, mm. just does what it says on the tin. And so mm. if you have that book translated into German, and people will be searching for that in German, and you won't need to like we get quite a lot of organic sales on that stuff because. Mm. I guess that market's not necessarily as developed yet as it is, you know, in, in America, in the UK, there's so much noise. Of course there is, and especially for, for fiction. But I think that market is still developing in other parts of the world. And if you, I think if you have your, your nonfiction stuff, I think what you'll, you'll find is that your, your organic sales will probably, no promises, man, don't come after me. <laughs> then we bump into each other like every now and again at events. You told me that I, my, my feeling is that, you know, that if you, you've got the reputation that you've got, people will be looking for your books in, in German and Spanish and, and Portuguese. But the other side of it is, and this is what you weigh up, is that actually, well, a lot of people in those countries will speak English. Are they just going to buy your book in English? <laughs> you know, yeah, they, and we're so lucky to publish in English first. I mean, we, we are, I acknowledge how lucky we are being able to do it this way. But I do think that there is a growing, I certainly think the Spanish language is particularly interesting because of the American Spanish speaking. I think Spanish is, well, it, it may even be the largest spoken language in America within a generation or something. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah quite possibly. Yeah, I mean, it's, really it's, it's been great. Like, I'm, I'm probably as bad as anyone else, but I do check in you know, like into my, you know, like it's, it's normally a lot of my books are in the top 100 for, for guitar, so I kind of do have a little check-in every day to see what's going on. And, you know, maybe a few times a month I'll see a Spanish-language book in the top 100 guitar you know, like one of one of ours, fortunately, but it just shows that people are looking for that. Yeah, but you know, again, it's not something I can necessarily shed light on for, yeah. for novels and things. I do. Difficult. I find it, yeah, really fascinating. It's every time I talk to you, you know, when I see you at events or whatever, and I'm just like, oh, I really must do a nonfiction work, and then I and then I move off and do something else. But um, I do want to come on to something which is really interesting. I think in the book. Uh, which is this balancing of of lifestyle and money because I think you know I think when we like you said you were you know music teacher and then you started making a bit of money and then you started making a lot more money and then you've scaled your business and uh you know now we're you know we could be in world domination mode (laughs) in so many ways but you you talk about kind of breaking under the strain and I want I want us to acknowledge how hard you've worked but also that you've reflected on what you want and how how to have a healthy, sustainable life. So can you talk a bit about how that yeah. happened and, and kind of yeah. how you're dealing with it? Um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time alone in front of a computer. And like, while well, you know, I've, I've been with my girlfriend for eight years and I've got friends and like, my dogs and things like that, what I found was... I don't, it's, it's, it is such a difficult thing to put in, into words and it is something that I, I want to be really honest about because, 
you know, it's not something that I'm ashamed of. And I, th- my, my suspicion is that because writing can be quite a lonely pursuit is that I think the first thing to say is that, and it genuinely, 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 this has never, never been about money. And it's, I think it's important to say that because I think if it, if it was, I don't think I would have done quite so well. I think you start making decisions like about what you're producing and why you're producing it. I mean, like I can think of three or four books I could just do right now and that'd be like super successful, but they they would I I, I don't know I won't I won't go down that route. But it, it's not it's not about that. It's about kind of helping people learn to play guitar. And I don't you know I don't want to sort of make it sound like you know it's just been like doing this stuff just to make more and more money because like after about two years i sort of had enough to kind of like yeah cool i can go and live in thailand for a year quite comfortably and keep doing what i was doing Mm. and it's really been it's more out of interest and it's more out of like the, this kind of challenge of doing it you know what i mean like you, you you hear about a lot of people who sort of really like they they make make a great big company and they sell it and they've got all this money and it's like right well what's the next thing because it's not it's not about the cash it's about the the, the net taking the next step it's about keeping your, your mind occupied it's about keeping you know having something to focus on and having meaning in, in what you do so that that's sort of been the driver but because of that and partly you know and it's not amazon's fault certainly but partly because you know it's it's a bit of a it could be a bit of a precarious kind of existence i don't know if if, if you know other people relate to this but there's a kind of well what you know if what if it you know we get shut down and like like no people have sort of had all their, their accounts closed or whatever and things can just seem to stop so I think one of the reasons I was working so hard was to try and build in a bit of redundancy, you know, like, well, you know, what else, you know, how I can sort of, um, so that, but anyway, the point being that I was just working harder and harder and harder and sort of spending less and less time coming out of the room. And I it ended up sort of being like kind of close to having a bit of a breakdown with it. It was, it was, um, it, yeah, it was, it was just very lonely. I think that that was the thing. I was just spending too much time in my own head and just like turning down, going out and, and seeing friends just so I could focus on the next thing and get that done. I remember like saying to um, Tim, who who runs the, the, the sort of, you know, the, the author services company I work with. And it, I was like, you know, like most, most times, if you work at a trad publishing company, they'll like have a big book launch and a big party for everyone and they'll go out and go, cool mission accomplished bit of downtime and then start the next one for me it's just like right that one's done like what's next mm-hmm. and i think there was no real payoff and it was all hard work with no real thing so it got to last november and i was like at the point of walking away and what that ha- what happened I, st- I i was writing this book with martin taylor who's a great jazz guitarist he invited me up to scotland to go on his guitar retreat i met him and again he's got this service company and now we sort of speak every day on the phone mm-hmm. <laughs> and having someone to to work with you completely understands and um that that's made the biggest difference so i know it's sort of a big long rambly answer i don't know if i, I know if i've said anything there, <laughs> but it, well i think you've said that you need to have a support network you can't yeah. just be on uh, in your room on your own and yeah. you know and also that perhaps celebrating success and taking time off is a good idea i think recognizing it i think that's something i've always been bad at is just recognizing success because still people come up to me it's like oh it's amazing what you've done it's incredible i just for me it's just something that i've done it's not like yeah yeah it's great man i've done all this it's just like oh well it's, it's kind of it's just what i do and i feel very grateful that it's gone well and i feel very grateful that it's it you know my books are selling but it's just kind of who i am and what i do it, it's not anything to sort of shout about really and mm. that's kind of really what the new book's about even you know like i did so unsure about the title of it and it's not necessarily what I want to be known for. You know what I mean? It's got a whole different connotation. And um, 
but just a few people said it was a great title <laughs> so we, we've, we've gone with it um but the whole book really is has been about my experience of of everything that i've done step by step you know and and when i've sort of gone down a wrong path we've tried to sort of mention that and and why i've done what i've done and things but yeah i, I think you're right i think that support network thing is really important um the facebook groups and things are, are brilliant knowing other people are out there are brilliant but i would say try and try and take that offline as well if there's someone you're chatting to online about your books like pick up the phone go and see them if you can of course it's a big it's a big world but having having people around you that that can support you and understand what you're doing and and the sort of minutiae of writing that um to get it and being able to just vent you know mm. take it in turns for half an hour or whatever to let it off your chest and go outside and see people but yeah i mean i mean you talk about sort of balancing money and work the money's just not important it's just sort of there um i think the, mon- the money's important to a point but when you have reached whatever you know yeah is because some people are still struggling to make yeah. much at all but yeah. I agree with you there's a point where it's less about the money and more about meaning and what yeah. you're what you want to achieve in in the bigger sense yeah for me like uh not not going on a big you know sub story but like I I pretty much like grew up with nothing you know like we would you know quite we didn't have anything for me being rich is being able to like pay for the groceries and pay the gas bill without actually having to look at the bank account beyond that i'm not really you know it's great and it sounds really ungrateful it's not you know it's it's cool like you know it's it's very you know it's like say it is important to have the money it's a job of course it is you know you want and it's a measure of success in a way one measure of success certainly but yeah it comes down to meaning and vocation and um and hey and we can sort of, travel more if we make more money yeah <laughs> we, can, we can do cool shit <laughs> you know what i mean that's what, it, that's what it comes down to doesn't it it yeah. is absolutely and you can give it all away if you want i mean this is what yeah. this is what's the the point so i'm really glad we had this chat because it's been helpful to me and i mean i always find it so interesting when authors transition from being an author to being a publisher and there's been some you know there's some pretty big names who are now indies who've now moved across to publisher yeah and uh, I find that fascinating but tell people where they can find you and the book uh, and everything you do online yeah hoping to launch the book I think on the 17th of November if you like guitar books um, and all things musical it's fundamental-changes.com um, self-published millionaire like I say launching that on the 17th of November all being well and um, that's we're going to go wide on that one um, we're going to be paperback you know Kindle Kobo you, you name it iBooks is going to be out there um, for everything and and um, we're hopefully going to be running quite a big campaign for that as well but I think I think it is genuinely a useful book for anyone who who wants to get into writing but I think especially for people who are writing and want to know how to take the next step in terms of marketing and getting you know getting your book seen and and um you know getting a great cover done and all that that kind of thing you know that there's there's advice in there that I've, I've not really held anything back i've tried not to hold anything back just everything that i've done over the last sort of six years um and also very quickly because i know we need to wrap up but um my co-writer tim he's had 20 years in the publishing industry he's done loads of ghost writing he's been involved in the production of around about a thousand like traditionally published books and some really big ones and so throughout the book yeah there's my perspective as a as an indie author but then there's his perspective it's like actually you know what if you want to do this as a trad publisher you know as a trad sorry a trad writer or a trad author then you know this is this is kind of what the the publishing house or your agent would want to see kind of thing so you know we try to not dilute it too much but but definitely sort of think about people who who want to either go indie or who who do want to go trad with it as well Mm, fantastic well thanks so much for your time joseph that was great that's a pleasure thanks thanks having me on